message notes, uh, raise your hand and somebody will bring you one. I think most of you probably got those as you came in, um, but it'd be very helpful for you to have those tonight. Then I've got a handout at the very end that's going to give 12 additional points that you can just have uh, on your own. Uh, the only reason, the only reason that I'm doing this tonight, okay, is I am submitting to my wife. The Bible says, submit ye to one another, all right? And I've, I had a meniscus surgery on Thursday. I am doing awesome. I've had zero pain, but I can't put full weight on it yet. And so in obedience to my wife, I am preaching from a stool. It's the first time ever. You can ask, Sammy, where are you? Did I ever preach from a stool in Wisconsin? I mean, a message. The answer is no, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, this is a first, and uh, it will not, and it will be a last, okay, Lord willing. All right. So, everybody needs, you need to have this in front of you. I am extremely excited about part two of the message that we started last week. And uh, if you weren't here, I'll give you a quick review. But you also want to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1. As you're turning, I'm going to be in the ESV if you have an option on your little iPads, iPhones, where you can do the certain translation you want. Uh, it's going to be the ESV. Is there solid evidence for the Christian faith? What proof is there that the Bible is more than just a book written by human authors? What evidence do we have that Jesus Christ really is who he claimed to be? How about the resurrection? Is there archaeological, scientific, intellectual uh, substantiation for things like the resurrection? Jesus' life, Jesus' death, the Bible being God's Word. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it, it defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, there is substance to faith in Jesus. That word substance in the Greek is hypostasis, which, is, which means a foundation or a substructure, something that is firm and real that supports something else. Faith is the substance, hypostasis, of things hoped for. In other words, faith in Christianity, faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the Bible as the Word of God, is not some blind leap in the dark where you have to throw your mind out the window and it's like some people get it and some don't. Well, they got faith, they just seem to be able to believe, but I don't. No. Faith is something that everybody can have. Because, and I believe that you can have it, especially when you see the evidence that supports Christianity. And so this is information that can strengthen you, and it's information that you can impart to others that are questioning, because I'll tell you right now, five minutes down the street, there are many that will engage with you in all kinds of interesting discussions, from the atheist club to the skeptic to maybe the sincere seeker. And we have answers. We have answers. In 2 Peter chapter 1, I was amazed as I came across this passage this week and how many of the verses here support some of the points we covered last week. Now, don't bring up the points yet, Bethany, but, but I'll mention them, but we're not going to cover them yet. I'll give them in a minute. But they're right here in verse 16 of chapter 1. Peter writing, remember Peter, was he the guy that, 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 that believed easily? No, he was denying that he even was a follower of Jesus the very week that Jesus was crucified. So this is not a guy who just kind of had that great ability to believe. His faith came at an exceptional level after an event in history, after two events in history, the resurrection and Pentecost. This is this Peter writing now. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Notice how many times he uses we here. He's basically saying, folks, this is not just something we made up. This is not just some philo philosophical system or a myth or a tale. We saw it. We were there. We were with him for three years. Verse 17. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves... We heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure. Wait a minute. How can something be more sure than, than the 
physical, tangible experience with Christ himself. Well, some could say, well, that's great for you, Peter. That was your experience. I'm not necessarily denying it. I haven't had that experience. I wasn't with him. What do I have that's that's maybe a little bit more tangible or black and white? Ah, verse 19, we have something more sure. The prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place. So we see the the changed life of Peter, and and he was an eyewitness. We're going to see in a moment that he was martyred for his faith in Christ. Here we have introduced prophecies about Jesus that are very black and white and tangible, something written many years before it happened, and then it happens just like it was predicted. That's pretty black and white. That's pretty kind of a little bit more tangible for some that will say, well, Peter, that was your experience, but it wasn't mine. And then he says, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The ultimate proof is going to be you and I experiencing a changed life. <laughs> Having God shine in our hearts, and that's what he wants for each of you tonight. If, 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 if the morning star has not risen in your hearts yet, I'm praying that that will be birth tonight. That the risen star will rise in your heart. That you will have hope and confidence and that the presence of the living God will literally come to indwell you tonight. It can happen. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Verse 20, knowing this, first of all. So now I'm going to explain to you how these prophecies work, he says. So now we have the proof of the Bible itself, the uniqueness of the Bible. Here's how it works. No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. In other words, this stuff didn't happen because of something that just man himself did. But look at this. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the Bible we hold. Men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Yes, Peter wrote it, but the Holy Spirit inspired it. Yes, John wrote it, but it was anointed by the Spirit of God. Yes, Matthew wrote it. Yes, Isaiah wrote. Yes, Moses wrote. But ultimately, it was God. It's His Word we hold. Further proof. For the, for, for, for the validity and the truth of Christianity. Then go to chapter 2. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. What he's saying here, right, off, right on the heels of all this evidence for our faith, he says, beware, folks. Because where there's truth, there's error. Where there's something of God, there's going to be something of Satan right on the heels of it. And we're experiencing that right now in our nation. It is time to live fully devoted for Christ because the enemy is attacking. False teachers are out there. And if you and I do not know why we believe and what we believe, we are in trouble. Great passage supporting so many of the points that we covered last week. Now, before I do a quick review of those points and get to our new ones, how many of you have heard of Ravi Zacharias? He was raised a Hindu, he was converted to Christianity, and he's now one of the greatest apologists. Remember, apologetics is defense of our faith. He's one of the greatest apologists in the world. I believe he is the most brilliant Christian alive. And he says this, you'll see it on the screen, two quotes. God has given us enough evidence to make faith a most reasonable thing, but not so much evidence that faith is unnecessary. (laughs) What I believe in my heart must make sense to my mind. And so what are some of those evidences that make faith a most reasonable thing? Number one, the uniqueness of the Bible. I talked about this last week. I shared how the Bible is unique and that it claims to be the very Word of God. Now that doesn't make it the Word of God, but it does make it a document to be reckoned with. It claims to be the very words of God, and in many places it says things like, Thus saith the Lord. That's powerful. Now some might say, well, what about other books like the Book of Mormon or the Quran that other faiths regard as holy books? Listen closely. Those books were written by one person. And in each case, those people's lives and character and actions are highly questionable in terms of godliness. (laughs) And yet the Bible was written by 40 different authors from all walks of life with a one unified message with no contradictions and that message is forgiveness of sins and salvation in Jesus Christ and a personal relationship with our Creator God. One additional thing here, and it's really cool. 
There are places in the Old Testament where God tells His people to do things that were way beyond the knowledge of the writers or even the culture of the most sophisticated of the day. For example, this is cool. The Old Testament contains several scientific examples that describe sanitary techniques that are thousands of years ahead of medical practices of the day. In fact, several of them align with conventional microbiological practices in the modern research lab. Such examples include scouring brazen containers and throwing out cracked pottery, Leviticus chapter 6. What I think might be the most remarkable is the instructions for sewage treatment. In Deuteronomy 23, God instructs his people to bury human waste outside the camp. This contradicted the contemporary practice in Egypt, which was the pinnacle of civilization and modern technology at the time. It wasn't until Louis Pasteur proposed the germ theory of disease in 1864 that bacteria was even considered pathogenic. Thousands of years earlier, predating the bubonic plague and many other pandemics, the Israelites were given inspired instructions on how to deal preventatively and reactively with microbial infections that contradicted all scientific and medical knowledge of their era. Did any of you know Wade Abbott when he was here doing his postdoctorate? Yeah, several of you. We knew him at Watkinsville First Baptist. He has a doctorate in biochemistry, a PhD in biochemistry. Look at this quote. I spoke to him over the phone this week, and he emailed me this quote, and it's very powerful. The medical microbiology outlined in the Old Testament provides compelling evidence that the Bible is supernaturally inspired. The instructions to the Israelites on how to cleanse and prevent infection were more than 3,800 years ahead of scientific discovery, and it completely contrasted the most advanced civilization of the day. This, to me, uses a naturalistic argument to substantiate that God lives and was active in the transcription of the Word. Personally, it was a profound source of solidarity during my formative years as a scientist as I wrestled with conflicting ideas stemming from my education and my faith. The uniqueness of the Bible. There's tons more data in every one of these points. That's why I've given you the resources that you can go to at the bottom of your sermon notes. If any of these hit home, we talked last week about how we're flying over, and if you want to land on any of these little cities, so to speak, you can go there, and if you need additional resources, you email me and I'll provide them. This is powerful stuff. This book has a divine author. And the greatest way to find out the validity of that statement is to read it for yourself and experience the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit speaking into your life at various times and in various situations. And one of the most amazing things to me, I can read a verse, many of you have experienced this, I can read a verse, and it's the hundredth time I've read the verse. And there's a new gem of insight that God gives you, or a new way that He applies it to your life that gives you hope and encouragement and strength. Number two, prophecies about Jesus. Prophecies are predictions made 700 to 1,000 years before Christ came. I shared many of those last week. I'll add one in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, written in 700 B.C. It predicts that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Euphratha, though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. (laughs) Talking about his physical birth, but it also speaks of his eternality. Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. So he's saying in Bethlehem, the Word's going to become flesh, but he's really existed from way before that, from all of eternity past. In one verse, 700 B.C. Luke chapter 24, verse 44, Jesus says that all the Old Testament was ultimately for one purpose, to point to him. And he gives in this verse the threefold division of the Old Testament which the Jews were familiar with. The law, the Psalms, and the prophets. Jesus said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Jesus said that the Old Testament was all to point to him. To point to him. And these prophecies 
not only give powerful evidence for Jesus being who he claimed to be, but he gives powerful evidence that this book has a divine author. Number three, the uniqueness of Jesus. Never has there been a man like him. The written word is always designed to point to the living word made flesh, Jesus. He was more than a man. He was God in human flesh. Lived a sinless life. Unconditionally loved people. Forgave sin. Taught with authority and power. Had insights and depth of insights into people and life unlike any other. He did miracles. Died for our sins. Bore the wrath of God for us. And ultimately proved his deity by the fourth evidence that I give you tonight. And this is where we pick up from last week. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here is where Christianity stands or falls. Christ is still dead, then Christianity is dead. Christ did rise. Then he is who he claimed to be. And there's great historical verification for the Christian faith. He physically appeared to more than 500 people after he rose. Pretty substantial evidence. And in a minute, we're going to see what happened to some of these witnesses. Many were like Thomas who said, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my hand in the very place where he was nailed. And Thomas did. Thomas bowed in worship and surrender. And I'll share with you a minute what happened in Thomas' death. Lack of disproving evidence is powerful in this case. Never has there been one shred of evidence presented that Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. There have been theories. The wrong tomb theory. Perhaps the disciples went to the wrong tomb. Highly unlikely. The swoon theory. That he didn't really die and the dampness of the cave that he was buried in kind of helped him recover. Highly unlikely. Others say that someone died in his place. Virtually impossible. He was very well known in that area. Finally, the story that the Romans used was that the disciples stole the body, then made up the story that he rose from the dead. Now, I guarantee you, with all the attention there was on Jesus at the time, if he had not risen on the third day, the opponents of Jesus, and there were many, all they had to do was take his dead body down the streets of Jerusalem, and Christianity would have died in her cradle. But that didn't happen. Instead, we have the fifth piece of evidence, and that ties right in with the fourth because this is very much connected. It shows what happens to those who were closest to Jesus, who were with him when he died and were there in person to see themselves whether, he not, whether or not he truly rose from the dead. I was talking this week to a former atheist converted to Christianity, and he said that personally this, next point, is the most powerful piece of evidence for him for the legitimacy of Christianity. And it's this, the martyrdom of Christ's followers. Eleven of Jesus' twelve disciples died a martyr's death. I'm not counting Judas in that twelve. He was replaced by Matthias. Matthias was stoned. Matthias was stoned and beheaded. The only one who wasn't officially martyred, <laughs> but when you hear his story, you're going to go, might as well have been, was the Apostle John. Though boiled in oil, he survived and then banished to the island of Patmos, of which I've had the privilege of going to. Listen closely. Andrew, Peter's brother, was crucified in Greece on a cross in the shape of an X. I've been to his tombstone. Was fastened with cords instead of nailed, which made his death slower. They now have an X cross in Greece called the Andrew Cross for that purpose. Thomas, remember doubting Thomas? Who had to put his fingers in the nail holes and wrists before he would believe? Well, did he believe? Oh, you bet you. So much so did he preach the gospel in India where pagan priests speared him. James, the son of Zebedee, killed with a sword by order of King Herod Agrippa I in 44 AD. It's recorded in Acts chapter 12. Philip was scourged, thrown in prison, and crucified in 54 A.D. at Helopius. Matthew, killed with an axe-like weapon in Ethiopia, A.D. 60. Thaddeus, crucified in A.D. 72. 
and many others that I could talk about that came after the immediate apostles of Jesus. Like those killed under Nero's persecution in A.D. 67 when he would light Christians on fire to serve as lamps in Rome. Others were put in the skins of animals and then allowed lions to attack and kill them. Peter. We saw earlier what he wrote. Peter who denied Jesus. But after the resurrection and after being filled with the Holy Spirit, he boldly went forth proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. This man Peter was radically transformed in a matter of two weeks as he experienced the resurrection and the filling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He died crucified upside down because, quote, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. That Peter wrote, Second Peter 1, 16, We do not follow cleverly invented tales, and we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. In other words, we didn't make this stuff up, especially in light of the opposition they faced. Peter says we were eyewitnesses of the person and the work and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it sank into our souls so deeply we're willing to die a martyr's death. Men and women and young people, an eyewitness is a very significant piece of evidence in the court of law. And when you have eyewitnesses saying the very same thing, it's powerful. I guarantee you, if if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, these apostles would have gone back to fishing, collecting taxes, and a number of other things. They would not have been willing to die a martyr's death. And it's also very significant, listen closely, that these men each died at different places at different times. It wasn't like they all grouped up and made some kind of suicide martyr pact. You know, let's go down as heroes. Not at all. Each was so convinced of the truth of who Jesus was and the eternal significance of salvation in Him that they and many others down through history died a martyr's death. Now listen carefully and think through this logically. People will die for something they believe to be true, but it's false. Muslim terrorists do that every day. Suicide bombers. But very few, if any, will die for a known lie. (laughs) And that's the difference here. These men were there to see firsthand whether or not he truly rose from the dead. The Fox's Book of Martyrs was written in the 16th century by a a man named John Fox. He spent 11 years researching the history of martyrdom up until his time, 16th century. So if you want to read in detail, not only some of the accounts that I've given you tonight, but many more, this is the book to get, Fox's Book of Martyrs. The sixth item of evidence for the Christian faith being true is tangible, physical, objective support, and it's this. Number six, archaeological support. Archaeology is when you dig up something that speaks to previous history. Similar to going to Gettysburg digging up guns and bullets and uniforms that speak to what happened there. Proof positive that many people died at Gettysburg in a three-day period. I've been to the Holy Land twice, Greece once, the Isle of Patmos once, Turkey once, where ancient Ephesus is, and I've had the privilege of seeing firsthand many tangible archaeological evidences for what the Bible says to us. Never has there been anything discovered that disproves or discredits anything in all the Bible or Christianity. That alone is very powerful. Because do do we not live in a world where if there was objective archaeological evidence that something that's recorded in the Bible was false or that something in Christianity is not true, wouldn't you know it'd come out and it hasn't. Now there's many who argue from silence. This was what happened when I was in college. I remember professors at the University of Georgia. Oh, the Bible's in error when it speaks of a group of people called the Hittites. We've never found anything that gives any evidence to the Hittites. Guess what? Ten years after that statement was made in one of my classes at UGA, what happens? Archaeology unearths an entire group or evidence for the 
people we know of as the Hittites. So be very careful when people use the argument of silence, that nothing's been found, therefore it's not true. Just give it a little more time. Another example is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1946 and 1947, which revealed documents and sources much earlier than anything we had had before, and everything supported the accuracy of the Bible and the truthfulness of Christianity. I have a file in which I keep on anything that I read or come across uh, on, on archaeological support for Christianity. 1997, the Associated Press article, Receipt Provides Evidence of King Solomon's Temple. A recent discoverer, a recently discovered piece of pottery recorded a donation to the house of Yahweh. It contains the oldest mention outside the Bible of King Solomon's temple. The three and a half by four inch artifact is nearly 3,000 years old, dating to a time when kings sent messages inscribed on pottery. Associated Press, Jericho study findings parallel that of the Bible. The walls of Jericho did come tumbling down as recounted in the Bible according to an archaeological study, and it gives detail. One of the most powerful articles, love this one, U.S. News and World Report, October 25, 1999, Is the Bible True? In this article, it begins with the amazing discovery in 1993 at Tel Dan in Israel when for the first time outside the Bible itself, there was evidence for King David. It was an inscription found that mentioned King David, not though by a Hebrew scribe, but rather by an enemy of the Israelites citing a victory by David over them. At the very end of this article, this is the quote that I want you to see on the screen. U.S. News and World Report. Okay, this is not a Christian magazine. All right? In extraordinary ways, modern, te- modern, modern archaeology has affirmed the historical core of the Old and New Testaments corroborating key portions of the stories of Israel's patriarchs, the Exodus, the Davidic monarchy, and the life and times of Jesus. Scholars are convinced there's much more out there waiting to be found. It's just a matter of time. (laughs) Folks, this is why this is so important. You know why this is so important? Because faith in Jesus Christ is rooted in history. Okay? Christianity is not just some philosophical system that we've come up with and that we all agree to. It's rooted in time, space, and history. God became a man 2,000 years ago. He lived, he walked, he talked, he died, he rose from the dead. Faith in Jesus is rooted in history. And that history is supported by all the kinds of stuff I've shared and there's much more out there that we don't have time for. You know what history is? His story (laughs) it's his story it's him acting in time and space and he's not a god that just does it way back then (laughs) he's not a god that just did it then but he's absent now the beauty is that the same god who parted the red sea the same god who sent jesus the same jesus who healed and and gave sight to the blind Hearing to the deaf is the same Jesus that wants to touch your life and mine and change us from the inside out. And that's the final point tonight. Evidence for Christianity ultimately is changed lives. One of the most powerful evidences for the truth of Christianity is people being changed. People coming out of drug addiction and alcohol abuse and fear and depression and purposelessness and broken relationships. Discovering hope and meaning and love and purpose and power in Jesus Christ. Beginning with, lives with the, beginning with the lives of the direct disciples and then those that followed and then all of those that have come from them right up into the present time, there is testimony after testimony after testimony of people radically changed by the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? And we know that Christians aren't perfect. And we know that Christian history is filled with very dark days where we would say, Maybe that was done in in the name of Christianity, but it is not true Christianity. However, overall, there's been no other religion or any other human organization that's done more good for people than Christianity. When you think of all the churches of Jesus Christ and the good they do, Christian hospitals, parachurch ministries, missions organizations, relief agencies, 
those that go to the lowest of the low of society, when you think of the Salvation Armies and the World Visions and the Samaritan Purse type ministries that have preached the good news all over the world, fed the hungry, clothed the naked, visited prisoners, given relief to famine victims, hurricane relief, tornado relief, it's very often Christians who respond with the most compassion and care. That's because of Jesus Christ. It's motivated by the person and the work and the power of Jesus Christ. Living proof that Jesus came to set the captives free. The bottom line tonight is this. Has your life been changed? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I didn't say to you go to church. Church doesn't make you a Christian. I didn't say to you believe in your head. Demons believe and shudder. I didn't say that ask if you're a good person. Good deeds don't make you a Christian. The Bible says two things are required. Repentance and faith. Repentance is to turn from a self-directed, self-controlled life to a Jesus-controlled, Jesus-centered life. Faith is not just an intellectual belief in your head. It's a trust in Christ alone for your salvation. What are you trusting in tonight to make you right with God? Are you trusting in your good deeds outweighing your bad deeds? Well, that won't cut it because perfection's required, and none of us are perfect. But Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sin that separates us from God. He came and He bore the wrath of God, the judgment of God, that rightfully comes against sin because God is holy and just, and He must punish sin. But because He's also loving, He he, he inflicted His punishment for our sins on His Son for you and me. And that by repenting of our sins and putting our faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation, we can be born again, made new, forgiven, reconciled with our Creator. That's called the gospel. The gospel. The good news. The good, eternal news. That man can be reconciled with a holy, omnipotent, all-powerful God. You do that by receiving Him into your life. You say, I, 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 I repent, God. I receive you. Jesus Christ, come into my life and take control. And at that moment, if you repent and place your faith in Christ, the Bible says at that moment, you are transformed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. The Holy Spirit comes at that very moment and He begins to live in your heart. And He begins to change you from the inside out. Have you experienced that? If not, tonight can be the night you receive Christ. You repent of your sins. And receive Him as your Lord and Savior. It can happen tonight. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. There's evidence, my friends, for Christianity. Not so much evidence that faith is unnecessary, but enough evidence to make faith a most reasonable thing. Let's pray together. If tonight, You need to receive Christ. I invite you to raise your hand. You're saying, I I need to, and I am receiving Christ tonight. I want you to raise your hand because I want to pray for you. Tonight you say, I'm repenting of my sins, and I'm receiving Jesus Christ in my life. Anybody? If you do need to receive Christ tonight, here's a suggested prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you, but, but, but prayer can be a way of expressing repentance and faith. Here it is. You can pray it in your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. I admit I'm a sinner and I'm separated from you. I invite you to come into my life and take control. I repent of my sins and place my faith in you alone for salvation. Come into my life, fill me with your Holy Spirit. and Change me from the inside out. Perhaps some of you tonight have pretty confident you've received Christ but he's not he doesn't have first place in your life many other things do you know the first commandment is we shall have no other gods before him and that's the first one that we're often the most guilty of you recognize some areas of your life that are not yielded to him but tonight you're saying I want to just make a fresh surrender I know I'm not going to be perfect tomorrow and it's not about that but it But there's something special about a fresh surrender. 
where you say, Lord, I surrender in a fresh and a new way. If that's you tonight, I want you to raise your hand. Just a fresh surrender to the Lord. Amen. God, I pray now that it's time of response.